イさんよりご講演をいただきましたえでは続きましてオードリー・タン台湾デジタル担当大臣にデジタルソーシャルイノベーションと題した講演を行っていただきますオードリー・タン大臣台北からオンラインでご出演をいただきますえではオードリー・タン大臣よろしくお願いいたしますミニスト・タン if you please start your session Hello、uh, and thank you, Kay, for the very excellent、uh, introduction to the ideas of participatory and agile governance.、Uh, and I will share some slides,、uh, but I look forward more、uh, to the panel discussion.、Uh, so I will skip over most of the slides actually that I have prepared.、Uh, do, do you see the slides of digital social innovation? Yes, you do. Okay, excellent. So,、uh, yeah, I'm Thomas Digital Minister in charge of social innovation. But when I say in charge, it doesn't mean that I'm working for the government. In In charge of something. I'm working just with the government, that is to say, with the people, not for the people, and with the government, not for the government. I'm somewhere at this Lagrange point、uh, between the movements on one side and the governments on the other side. And to facilitate fast, fair, and fun, the three pillars of digital social innovation. So I'll just use some、uh, examples.、Uh, like in Taiwan, we have this form、uh, of Collective intelligence called the PTT. The PTT is unique in that it doesn't have any advertisers or shareholders. It's squarely in the social sector, maintained for 25 years and running by the National Taiwan University students. And that's where, exactly、uh, in December 31st, in 2019, that Dr. Li Wenlang's message from Wuhan that said there's seven new SARS cases in the Huanan seafood market get triaged online, like with a lot of upvotes and so on. We, we very quickly focus. On it and start health inspections for all flight passengers coming in from Wuhan. And that means that, and unlike other more anti social social media, this is an actual pro social social media governed in an open source manner and that can actually tackle emerging social issues. And so we strive to allocate funding from the、uh, government and we classify them as digital public infrastructures that enable this kind of social listening so that we do not have to rely on the more anti social corners. Of social media for this sort of pro social conversation. Another example is the daily、uh, live press conference from the Central Epidemic Command Center. The commander, Chen Shizhong,、uh, basically r e s p o n d to not just journalists, but any people who call into this toll free landline number 1922 with any question whatsoever. And anything that the call center cannot handle、uh, in our daily 2 p.m. press conference, the minister himself、uh, handles it. For example, last April, there was a young boy that called 1922 saying, Hey, you're rationing our mask, which is Great, but I got the pink ones, which is not great. All the boys in my class have navy blue mask, and I don't want to wear pink to school. So the very next day, everyone,、uh, the, all the health officers wore pink.、Uh, and I think Minister Chen even said that Pink Panther was his childhood hero or something. So the boy became the most hip boy in the class where only he had the color that the heroes wear, and the hero's hero, I guess, wear. And, and this is、uh, this idea of very agile 24 hour literally response cycle、uh, that can actually navigate at a very fast speed. but With actually a lower risk profile. It's actually lower risk, and、uh, unlike if we say you know, bullying is bad or something, that would actually cause more frictions in this hairball. But simply by wearing pink, this is an act of gender mainstreaming that is basically fair for everyone. Now, talking about mass rationing,、uh, many of you in Japan may have heard. That last year,、uh, we we're rationing masks, but there was a real shortage. And so people don't want to go to the pharmacy that has already out of stock. So, uh, not uh, the GovTech people, the Civic Tech people, Gov0, G0V.TW, which for every government、uh, digital service、uh, ends in .gov.TW, they don't like. They just change an O to a zero, and you go to a shadow government that is more likable, I guess. The Gov0 people prototyped、uh, this mask rationing where you can actually queue in line and see. People before you swiping their national health card, and you see the actual depleting stock like in real time every 30 seconds. And so, my role is just to ensure that there's no privileged access. We actually publish every 30 seconds in an open API, like the Linux Foundation s、uh, t a n d a r d And then,、uh, more than 100 different tools like voice assistants, chatbots, and so on appear so people don't have to queue in vain. And the based,、uh, basic idea is that we distribute to the pharmacy, which align with the population centers almost perfectly. 
perfectly, so we feel fine. But people, after analyzing this real-time data, discovered there's a data bias because in the rural areas, people spend a disproportionate amount of time to travel to the five kilometer away on um, helicopter uh, pharmacy. So it's actually unfair. So this is data bias. But when data bias is pointed out, like literally daily, we can't just change our algorithm to uh, basically go through a pre-ordering or to change the distribution mechanism in the real time as the OpenStreetMap community feedback. Again, we change that just like that in 24 hours. Again, safer, but also swift. And finally, uh, the fun part, which I call humor over rumor, is it, really key. This is uh, beyond the original idea of nudge, which most of the people are not aware that they're being nudged. Humor over rumor basically use internet memes because all of us know the internet is designed for cute cats and dogs. Uh, and so in each ministry, there is a team, what we call participation office, uh, uh, around 100 people. Uh, and they work with professional comedians or if uh, they're professional comedians themselves, which is better. For example, the Ministry of Health, the commander's uh, participation officer, literally lives with stock, a, a Shiba Inu. Uh, and so when we roll out physical distancing, the meme goes like, when you're indoor, keep three Shibas away, outdoor, keep two Shibas away. Uh, and when we're rolling out mask rationing, you can see on the uh, right bottom, uh, this very cute dog says, the masks are there to protect your own face against your own unwashed dirty hands, which is a great message because uh, it appeals to everyone's self-protection um, instinct. And this is very much shareable. I mean, who wouldn't want to share this cute dog? Uh, and so this uh, invited remixes. And so this is all very intentional. People feel that they can actually co-create to increase the R value, the basic transmission rate of basic scientific ideas like mask wearing, uh, which makes this scientific uh, idea go viral, even more viral than this information. So this is why I call humor over rumor. Um, and so um, in this year, of course, we just had our real first wave, uh, but we're now down to single digits, uh, local confirmed cases. So how do we uh, roll out this contact tracing within just two months and reduce the confirmed cases to single digit? <clears throat> Again, we rely on this key idea called secure multi-party computation, which is a very nerdy idea. But the basic idea is that to preserve the privacy of people checking in to venues, we make sure that this data is stored in three different places without all the three is constant. There's no way to reconstruct people's whereabouts. So the idea is that all the venue owners can just use their phone, get a truly random number, uh, well, soon a random number anyway, and post it uh, on their uh, front of the, the door. Uh, but this random number does not actually link in any way to the place or latitude or longitude or GPS or whatever. This is just a random number assigned uh, to this particular venue. And by scanning it, it just triggered this SMS2 message. So it, it means that nobody need to install any app. Just you're using your phone's camera. You can't just send an SMS without actually unlock the, the camera. In the lock screen, you can complete this in just a couple of seconds. And so within a couple of seconds, what it does is it sends this number to 1922, which is already a trusted number, right? It's a toll-free number. And it doesn't go to anywhere uh, but your telecom. And so the telecom already has your number anyway, but it, all it has is this random number and it keeps it for 28 days. So only when contact tracer needed, do they get the venue uh, place uh, and the, the log in the telecom and your whereabouts, of course, because you're already confirmed with COVID. Uh, and then all these three pieces together enable automated exposure notification. But without all these three pieces, there's no way for people to infringe on privacy and there's no economic incentive for in, uh, privacy infringement anyway. And so the basic idea here is that we can't always design for data collaboratives, collisions between the people who don't mutually trust each other completely. And using uh, this kind of data collaborative, we can self-service and enable this massive contact tracing without uh, over squandering our privacy budget. And it's um, enabled in the first month more than 300 million SMS sent. And that uh, contact tracing uh, in coupled with our mask wearing, of course, uh, help us combat the first wave. And finally, I would like to uh, quote Dr. Tsai Ing-wen in her uh, inauguration speech four years ago, where she said, before we think of democracy as a showdown between opposing values, but now we need to think about democracy as a conversation between many diverse values. So from this idea of zero-sum showdown between sectors in the society to the co-creation between different sectors using this cutting-edge privacy-preserving ways to build data collisions is how we enable agile governance to solve the problems and challenges of our time. Thank you for listening. 
you for your valuable story. Thank you, Minister Tan. Eh, uh, then, uh, 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 それではここからは伊藤さん、再びよろしくお願いいたします。はい、よろしくお願いします。Um, one question, Audrey and、uh, Kate, were you able to watch the previous panel? Did you hear the conversation that we had with the ministers?、Uh, I watched, but I didn't quite listen because the sound wasn't going through.、Uh, okay, okay.、Um, で、最初の質問、村井先生にしたいんですけど、あの。ちょっと待って、これ。なな何語パネルですか Many years. I haven't seen so much fast, fair, and fun as a theme, but do you think it works? And do you think, is that something that you were thinking about? I know you've mentioned. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think、uh, you know, yeah, I've been talking with Audrey many times, and then, you know, so、uh, I, I think, you know, a lot of things I'm、uh, kind of learning from, from uh, the, uh, Audrey's operation and the other. Uh, you know, kind of strategic、uh, process, including the you know, kind of FFF. And the, then, the, probably one of the most、uh, difficult p a r t if you know, kind of I kind of copy the、uh, policy into the Japanese、uh, demonstration, then the last word, <laughs> fun. You know, so、uh, it's uh, very much uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, it, will, it has been difficult. So I, I talked in a previous discussion that, uh, uh, that for 20 years this is a kind of pushed by the private sectors, and the government sectors didn't、uh, really you know, kind of employ the digital technology for the digital I mean, services. Therefore, the digital services was, has been you know, a little bit of uh, uh, immature、mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in the country. And uh, so, uh, but uh, I think uh, it's uh, because of the, you know,、uh, the you know, various systems that、uh, you know, the government employee and the, you know, the, the mission of them and the,、uh, other things. So、uh, I learned from、uh, Audrey many times it's,、uh, the kind of he, people, the you know, kind of private sector people around,、uh, you know, so、around her and、uh, then you know, doing the operation. And、uh, with a kind of a very much innovative ideas collected、uh, from the、uh, kind of expert people、mm -hmm. in, the, in, the, in the commercial field. So that's what uh, I uh, heard from the Audrey. And uh, then, uh, therefore, it's a, a great impact. And also, you know, with a fun、mm -hmm. in the South f o r f o r and things. So,、uh, you know, I, I was watching her. Happily introducing her, you know, the, 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 what, what, what she did. And, uh, you know, the, mm -hmm. So uh, that's, that's probably what we need to work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Japanese do have some comedians in the government, but they don't usually get enlisted to be comedians so much, right? Yeah, the, their mission in the Japanese government、uh, is that,、uh, you know, not to fail. You know, so,、uh, you know, understand the risk and not to fail, and they start up but not conclude. You know, so th that's basically the very simple way of phrasing、mm -hmm. their work. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, I, th I hope、uh, this will change. But, you know, this n e e d to be changed because of the COVID 19 situation, because the people, all the people in this country notice that,、uh, you know, this is not the way、mm -hmm. we should be. I mean, the government should be, and the government service should be. Type yeah. of thing. Now, I think、uh, we're going to get、uh, you know, kind of great support and understanding、uh, comparing with the past. 
But, but I, I find that Japanese can sometimes be more fun than the Americans. I think Americans are sometimes even more formal. But I don't know if you, what, Kate, if you think about what you think and whether some of the stuff that Audrey talked about, like memes, is anything the government in the US would ever consider or have done? <laughs> Well, that's Tonari no Shiba wa Oh, yeah, the, yeah the, the grass is always greener. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, <laughs> you know, looking, looking at the United States, looking at the Taiwan, you know, they are doing very well, and then we are not. You know, that's basically yeah. Yeah, probably the mutually, uh, you know, we feel like that, mm -hmm. in a sense. Yeah. Um, and, uh, Kate, you know, some of the things that you talked about. You know, I think you, you said you were a member of the Pre Presidential Innovations Fellows. Um, I think that that, you know, we talked about this a little bit in the earlier panel about how you bring private sector people in um, and how they um, contribute and participate, how they're incentivized. But I don't know if you can talk a little bit about maybe how that works and what doesn't work. And because I think that's really one of the things that we're trying to figure out, the culture also of, of private sector people in government. Yeah, um, it was. It's been a really interesting evolution, I think. Even from the very, it's so basically the, the start of it, as I understand it, was was a six month time frame, and it was a very, very small amount of people, relatively. Um, and then you know you kind of watched them go on to like five of them started 18F, and you you, you can see the entrepreneurial spirit just coming through. Now they had a lot of permission. There was even the you know even in kind of my class, which is class three or four by that point, I did feel like I was just in this you know I, I had I I had some recognition that I was in a bubble within a bubble within a bubble of the actual system, uh, and then kind of moving in and doing and starting something myself in an agency and embedding, you know I got I got kind of the full how long is this like the full kind of entrenched how long is this going to take and then now I'm the creator of bubbles for other people. Um, and you realize kind of the, the systematic, you know, hopefully I'm doing my part to kind of enable others in that way. I will say, you know, I think Jen was right. We haven't really seen a resistance to joining, but we also had a bunch of corporations, uh, if I understand it right, was there was a host of corporations and, and organizations that would give people civic leaves to go do it. So, um, you know, I think Microsoft and, and a host of other places it, it, you didn't have to kind of completely leave your job. You could take a civic leave to do your kind of tour of duty for your one or two years or however long it was. And I think this was a major enabler for people to join the program. But we, we have seen, I think we've also seen maybe more people stay than originally anticipated, which was an interesting finding, I think, where you, you get in and you start this work and you realize, like for me personally, I can just say that I got in, I started this work, I felt like I had a lot of kind of impact in a shallow way, if that sounds weird. Like I was able to get stuff out the door and produce these, what I felt was like really fun and, and great projects with high impact. I, but, but I was kind of realizing the extent to which I wanted to keep working on these problems that were more intractable, that were, you know, kind of a little bit stickier, that were going to involve more than just a website launch. And how was I, and, and it was, you know, like it was, it got to be something where I was more incentivized to stay and see what I could do, knowing that that hill was going to be a lot harder to climb. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I, I certainly think it was an interesting, it's, you could argue it was kind of fueling the start of, of a full, of kind of the digital movement as we saw it in some ways. Mm -hmm. uh, may, may I, yeah, okay. The, yeah, I, I need to, uh, raise a question to uh, both of you actually the, you know starting with the Kate that uh, uh, you know the the as uh, you have noticed that the Japan digital agency is going to be a you know, kind of first agency government agencies officially uh, committed to work uh, both uh, you know kind of uh, private experts together with the government employees right and uh, so uh, the, at least the ratio, uh, you know, uh, very, very new in terms of, uh, you know, more commercial uh, biz, uh, business people, I mean, business experts in, to be involved. So uh, what is the uh, uh, most, I mean, do you, do you feel difficult, I mean, do you identify the difficult 
parts or you know do you fixing the difficult part that uh, you know creating the harmony between the private experts and the government employees working together for the same same mission same type of thing yes i think this is one of the hardest challenges and i think that there's multiple theories on how this plays out um, I think this kind of gets to some of the tensions which I was mentioning, where this tension will kind of always exist, and then it's a matter of picking where, like, when's that mo move where you really challenge the hairball and you challenge the system, and can you get folks who are, you know, maybe you've been living in it. I mean, the most ideal scenario as, a, as someone coming in with my perspective was to get, was to partner with someone who had been doing it for a very long time, hopefully get them to see some kind of new way of doing it, and then have them say, we should do this differently, right? And, and not be kind of forced by me in some, but the time, again, I think you have to play on the time frames. And what we learned, I think, was that that typically takes a suite of things. So you'll, so even in the organizations that we see, um, like US Digital Service, for example, I think is like very fast moving, uh, can kind of go into a situation, can respond very quickly, and, and the organization is set up to do that. Um, ATS, for example, is much larger and much and much more consultative based. And they, they tend to kind of partner in a way that's longer term change management of an organization. And so I think having the idea that you'll need all those things mm. and it won't it, it actually will it will take multiple organizations and approaches in order to actually harmonize it. Like you'll you'll you're it's much more like an orchestra, I think. You'll have many mm. you'll have many instruments and many players and many people doing kind of different types of things that the question will be, can you kind of come up with a, a suite that will allow them to be complementary in some way? Also, I wouldn't discount external orgs like nonprofits and civic, act, civic actors, right? Mm. Right. right. Uh, I mentioned the social sector, which is uh, my preferred term for the nonprofit, because they're they're for purpose. Sometimes also with profit. So uh, nowadays, social entrepreneurship is really a thing in Taiwan. So most of them actually have some revenue stream. It's just that they uh, commit to reinvest 100% uh, to you know the purpose that they're they're leading. Uh, and really, that is the backbone of not just Gov Zero, but most of the innovations that I outlined. Uh, as I mentioned. Uh, we didn't invent this. So my uh, team, the public digital innovation space, is not strictly speaking GovTech. Uh, our co-creators, our initial hires, uh, are from, from IDEO, uh, from the Copenhagen Institute for Interaction Design, RCA for Service Design, and so on. So basically, they're, they're space designers, participation designers, and the actual tech mm. happens in the civic space. And we use open source tools, we use creative commons for our conversation and things like that. So we do not see ourselves as problem solvers, but rather, uh, someone who pairs the problem solvers in the civic space, in the social sector, mm. with the people who are very much the expert in uh, articulating this problem, but not necessarily solving them in the public sector. So my office is half career public service and half civil society experts. Mm -hmm. mm. And, and both of you mentioned sort of design-like things. And I know um, we talked about product um, earlier with uh, Jennifer. Um, but it, it seems like there is a... Uh, a I think that when you look at infrastructure, it looks very much like IT. But as it gets closer to the actual service and the customer, it looks a lot more like design. And I think that design, rather than just visual as design, but system design, design thinking has become a really important part. And that starts to pan across all kinds of government services. But how, I mean, we, you, you all, we always use the word digital, but how much is it about design, and, and where do you see the designer fitting into all of this stuff? I don't know if either of you have. And, and Kate, you're a designer originally, right? I am, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I had a design background, which was, which was very interesting. And, I, and honestly, I think we've, one of the best experiences about PIP was just you were kind of paired in a way with people who were t coming from totally different backgrounds. So I was, you know, you would have kind of equal parts design, you know, kind of front end, back end, service designers, uh, you know, kind of like people who are really expert at uh, participatory design in lots of ways. 
um, all the way to, you know, my first PIF project was kind of like with a very hardcore data scientist. And I, it took me a while just to even translate what language he was speaking. I could, and it was one of the coolest experiences. And then I kind of, you know, fell in love with data science and tried to learn everything about it. So um, I do, I do think that, uh, you know, you know, service design is like a critical component. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm obviously biased, but I think that's when it boils down to that really good service design, you can, you can tell. Yeah. The, um, yeah. You know. mm -hmm. One thing about the kind of service design type of a discussion, then, you know, the, the digital, when the digital uh, service design, then uh, it w should apply the other, uh, you know, uh, past the silos and the beyond the silos and the, then you know, providing the digital services in a kind of a horizontal way, right? And uh, so vertical versus uh, horizontal way. And uh, then you know, um, it's been, you know, uh, very difficult to uh, convince in the co common design philosophy to all of the different silos, right? So w what do you think about the you know, kind of a design um, being a designer and then you know, uh, that kind of a, a silo versus a horizontal uh, common platform type of thing? Mm, a lot of it, I think, is in the language that we use. Um, in, in Mandarin in Taiwan, when somebody learns like JavaScript or Python, um, they're not software engineers. They would say they're uh, which is um, program design or designers of mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So just by building this, not only we get much better gender equality uh, in the enrollment uh, of students, but actually we get a much more well nuanced, like connecting people to people viewpoint of learning to program rather than just mm -hmm. this connecting machine to machine, which is being automated anyway by OpenAI Codex and friends nowadays, like literally every day, right? So by focusing on the people to people connection, I believe what we're doing is not uh, challenging the silos, but uh, using a Buckminster Fuller quote, uh, inventing new systems that will slowly render the old ones obsolete. That is to say, by connecting people in a much more pro-social way, people would then prefer to take their knowledge, their wisdom from their silos to this new hub where they can connect better. Mm -hmm. And, and architecture is a very related word, and I know Jun right. is very much an architect, and I think it feels like the lower layer people like to use the word architecture, and the higher level people often use the word design, but it's, it's, it's I mean, the, the ideal people also kind of mix those together, but, but I think, you know, Jun, to, to your point about the horizontal, I think that the one key thing that I think we haven't done very well is come up with very strong common architecture that's robust, and I think that's, Partially, it's the role of academia as well, right, to help manage that conversation. Yeah, that's, that's interesting to distinguish the architecture and the design. And the, both are design, I understand, but then they, when they're uh, in a design process, then they, it's uh, looking at the more toward the people yep. and the users mm -hmm. rather than the you know, kind of uh, system itself. So, uh, but anyways, mm -hmm. so that's very important discussion, I believe. Yeah. And I guess I would just add the one thing that's been kind of helpful for us um, in kind of breaking down relative silos and government, like for, on the worker.gov project, for example, um, you know, that was kind of like seven agencies and sub-agencies that all owned some portion of the content for where sub workers should get, mm. you know, should access their rights. Um, and really the, the, the only way we were kind of really able to execute on that project, which was like bring everybody together and create kind of like a unified experience was to just relay customer mm. voice, right? Relay the public voice um, to like have real quotes, have real stories, have these people who are trying to find their rights and they can't do it. Uh, and then just relay that and say, you know, uh, this, you know, they're, they're good design is they're almost telling us it's not so hard. They're almost just telling us this is this, this is the step. Um, and then this is just your part in the service as like one person in a larger idea of what's going to make it a unified experience for them. Mostly people get on board with that, I think. So we have like a minute and a half. I don't know if anyone wants to make final comments or advice for us as we embark in the digital agency here in Japan. Well, I can read my job description if that helps. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. 
Okay, uh, my job description, uh, which is a really a poem that I wrote five years ago, uh, basically uh, transitions from, from IT-based thinking to also incorporate design-based thinking. It goes like this. Uh, when we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is right here. That's very good. So I think that's a great way to end this panel. Thank you, everyone, very much for your participation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Live long and prosper. We thank all the speakers for the session. The panelists and the members, so much for your attention. Thank you.